Okay, so we're starting with uh, our sessions in here today. Matthew Gerard's going to talk about his uh, open source framework that he developed. So uh, please enjoy. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the presentation. Not easy to be on stage after after Guy, but we're going to try to uh, to uh, to enjoy some uh, some interesting talk today. Um, especially because not all the slacks have a, a black background, and, and I've checked the, the minimum font is 28, so it should not be too, uh, too, too bad for now. Uh, but so, yeah, thank you um, for, for being here, and we're going to speak about the open source framework for, uh, for indoor location. Um, and as uh, Guy also spoke about, so he said there are different maps. Uh, so we had maps 1.0, maps 2.0, 3.0 of the traffic. Uh, and let's see if we're getting into maps uh, 4.0 with, uh, with the indoor. Um, so I'm uh, Mathieu Gérard. I'm from France. Uh, that's where uh, we have based our, our company MapWise. So I have an engineering background. I did my PhD in uh, uh, systems and control. It's a bit between signal processing and, and robotics. Um, and so today, we've, uh, I've been funding MapWise a few years ago with the idea of bringing maps to the uh, inside of the um, uh, of the building, so we really saw that there was some interesting things to uh, to do over there, uh, and and so that's that's why we we created that. So it's based in uh, uh, based in France and visiting for the for the conference. So as I say, map-wise, the objective is to uh, bring the maps to the inside of the uh, of the buildings, and so what we are creating is tools for building managers to digitalize their maps, and then the SDKs for developers to use them into their own. Uh, mobile applications. And maps have been around for centuries. So that's one of the uh, extremely old maps that we can find from civilization, from 1300s. Uh, and so from the very beginning, uh, people have been trying to represent the world they live in, um, and so also provide the tools in order to be able to find, uh, to find their way around uh, in areas that they haven't been visiting before. Um, and so 20 years ago, maps looked a bit more like that. So that's the, the map 2.0 that uh, Guy was mentioning. Uh, so we had uh, a lot more uh, work that has been done in uh, data acquisition, putting the, the roads out there, but it was still a uh, paper version of the maps. And so you remember, they were printed in different scales. You would have to open different maps if you wanted to get into more uh, details. Uh, and it was quite hard uh, to navigate on those maps and to know I need to go from point A to point B, how am I going to do that? The eternal debate, are men better than women at uh, navigating on the maps? But let's not get into that debate right now. Um, and uh, so we, we would really have to, uh, to put some efforts in order to, um, uh, to use them. Uh, by the way, so Lille is right in the middle. That's where the, the company is based. And so uh, London is on the top left, Paris on the south, and Amsterdam on the on the top right for those who, uh, uh, who know a bit more those, those uh, cities in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and so, of course, if we look at maps today, uh, we see that it's completely different, it's completely digital. Uh, you can zoom in and get an incredible uh, level of detail just by simply scrolling the, uh, the mouse or, or pinching your phone, uh, and you can really get a lot more uh, data in, in, in your pocket. Uh, and so it's also daily updated and, and so on. And if we come back to location, since the very beginning of time, people try to, to realize, where am I on that map? Uh, and so, of course, if you're on Earth, you can use the uh, visual clues that you see around you. What do I see? What, what buildings do I see? What road do I see? Uh, if you don't see, it's much more complicated. And so that's one of the uh, sex things. It's really interesting to, to see how it actually works, because we've all seen those, uh, those things in museum. Uh, but basically, you need to measure the angle between the horizon and the sun at noon. So once per day, you would get a measurement of your latitude. So how far you are from the equator. The higher the sun goes in the sky, the, first, uh, the, the closer you are to the, to the equator. So that would give you one measurement per day, and only if it was uh, sunny, so you could know how, how high you are uh, uh, compared to the equator. If you need to, to get your longitude, you would need to get uh, an extra tool, which is a clock, a clock that would measure the time that it is at the place you departed. And so at noon, you would know that it's a certain time where you are, and you would check what time it is at departure. And the difference in time would give you how much you've been traveling across, uh, across the globe. So again, pretty, uh, pretty complicated to get, requiring uh, good uh, uh, time measurements, which was not easy at the time. Um, and so you would get one measurement per day. So 
really, really interesting, and people have been, tr and been doing it for, uh, uh, for centuries until we ended up with GPS. And so GPS uh, completely changed the way we are considering location today. Uh, GPS, when the first satellite was launched in 78, so that's really not that long ago, and it became fully operational in 93. In 91, a, a GPS receiver was still weighing 23 kilo. Imagine having a 23 kilo receiver in, in your pocket today. Of course, the, the, everything got, got miniaturized, but it's, it's, it's quite impressive to see how, the, how, how fast it evolved. Uh, so the, the first use was military. Afterwards, they opened it for the general public. And so I don't know how much you guys are familiar with that, but just to give a few ideas. So the way it works is that each satellite has an extremely precise clock an atomic clock, uh, and they're all synchronized between each other. Uh, and so continuously, each of the satellites will emit a frame saying, this is where I am, this is the time of my clock. Uh, and so that frame would be, would be emitted, and the receiver that is on Earth would receive the uh, different signals, different frames from the, from the satellites, measure the time at which those frames arrive, and then using the combination of the different signals that you would hear, you would basically first reconstruct the time, because your GPS receiver doesn't have an atomic clock that is uh, synchronized, so you would you need to reconstruct the time, and then you would get the, the, the time that it takes a, a signal to come from the satellite to the receiver, and since you know how uh, waves propagate across the atmosphere, you would transform that into a distance, and by combining multiple distances, you would know where you are. So depend, combining two, three, four satellites would, would be uh, giving you some positions. Uh, of course, if you make the math, you would usually need more four satellites, but since one point is usually like, on the other side of the, of the planet or like, really far into space, uh, a, few, a few less can, can, be, uh, can be enough. So, so that's, that's how it works. Extremely uh, complicated piece of, of technology, but that really changed the way we are using the map uh, and the and navigation every day. And so in 2004, we ended up having those kind of devices uh, where it, was, it, it, it also changed completely the way we are uh, looking at, the, uh, at navigation. And, and today, uh, it's, it's really, really amazing. We can say we are at a certain place, and then we know we need to go somewhere else, but we never do any planning. We know that we enter the car, we type the address, and it's going to get us there. And we got, even got before uh, a text saying how much time it would need to, to get us there based on traffic. So it really changed the, the way we, we think about, uh, uh, about moving. And of course, the uh, raise of the mobile, the digital map, the GPS, uh, that's 3.0, the live traffic. That's what we know every day. But so what's the status of all of that when we enter a building? And actually, it's not that, that good uh, to, today. So everybody speaks about the smart building, a building with a lot of digital services, building that would be more efficient, more productive for all the people uh, going there, working there, living there. But if it comes to, to map and how you can actually move around the building, we are totally still at paper age. And of course, you go to a conference and you get a paper map. And you go to uh, a shopping mall and you get a paper map. You know, everywhere you go, you get a paper map. And somehow, it still feels normal. It still feels like we, we, we are at the paper age of the old door of 20 years ago. Uh, so that's, that's really strange to me. But that's, that's still the situation we're in today. And still, all the blueprints, they exist. Every single company, every single building has blueprints. The architects have them. They are used for security because you're obliged to put them on the wall for the firemen to, to use them. And they're used for real estate, for maintenance, and so on. But it's extremely limited to only a few people in the company. And so the goal, I mean, one of my goals, is to really get those floor plans out there make the tools so that the floor plan is not only used by a few people in the company, but really available to everybody who needs to use it. Of course, there are privacy concerns. You don't want to get the uh, floor plan of, of everybody uh, open to the, uh, to the general public. So you need to make sure that everybody gets the, the level of details that they need, depending on the role. You get maps for the visitors, for the employees, for the security people, for the maintenance guys. And, and that's going to that's gonna change, of course. But, the, the goal is to get those floor plan ups there. And, and that's one of the missions that, uh, that we have for, uh, for MapWise. But on the other hand, we still do not have 
a global indoor positioning system. Uh, the GPS doesn't work inside because since you don't, when you're inside, you don't have any direct light of sight with the, uh, the, with the satellites. And so since what you're measuring is the time between uh, the moment the signal leaves the satellites and when it reaches your phone, if it needs to go inside and needs to get into, uh, in, into the building, all the time it takes inside the building, it's time that it should not have taken. And so basically, it completely messes up the, uh, uh, the, the measurement. And we clearly see when we are inside places, inside buildings, where obviously there is, for example, only one window, that we are positioned at that window. Because that's what the, the signal, signal thinks in terms of where is the last moment that signal actually deviated to the, to the satellite. So GPS is not, is not usable. And so that's why uh, a lot of different companies, a lot of different um, engineers have, have thought about solutions to try to position yourself inside. And that's what we're going to uh, look at, what, what are the different, the different options. Um, and, and how we can then use those to, to bring the, the digital services. And if you, if you see uh, mapping and positioning, they've always been quite, quite different. And for, for me, it's also really important to say that it's usually done by two completely different players. You have the players, and if you relate back to the outdoor, you have the players that put the satellite in the sky and operate them, and you have the players that actually do the map that you have uh, that you are using every day, and it's it's not the same people. And and the problem is that um, when it comes to the to the inside, uh, it's it's exactly the same thing. There are some companies that try to do a bit both, and then they they end up not really having the perfect solution. But you really see that some some companies are specialized on on the positioning part, and some other on the um, on the mapping. And and when we started into mapping, the last thing we wanted was to get involved with the positioning. However, in a lot of projects that we've been doing, the client or the, the end user wanted to combine mapping and positioning. Makes sense, because that's what they're, they're living every day on the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the road navigation. So for a few years, for two years, we've been building custom integration to get map-wise maps with this specific provider, that specific provider. And, and at the end, it was quite complex, a lot of support, trying to get uh, different parties to work together. And, and that was really not easy to, uh, uh, to, to handle. So at last year, we decided to get into a complete open source strategy. Uh, open source strategy, so on one side, we decided to open source a lot of things within the, the MapWise ecosystem. Uh, and that was already quite, quite complicated, handling the, the discussion with the investors, with the other uh, business partners in the, uh, in the company. Uh, that's, that's always quite, quite tricky when you mention open source. Um, but we also took the step to build the indoor location framework. So a framework that would standardize and then allow us to combine and process indoor location data. The objective was to say, we want to be able to use any kind of um, indoor location positioning system with any kind of other tool behind it. Um, and those need to be, uh, to be, to be working together. Um, and so we, we thought, OK, all those integration that we've been doing so far, trying to couple uh, different providers with the uh, mapping service that we're providing, we are going to release that in open source. And, and that's what I want to also talk about today during the, um, during the presentation. So what does it mean to standardize in the location? Location today is, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the GPS, so coordinates, you have latitude, longitude that position you anywhere in the world. You have an altitude. Uh, you have an accuracy. That's how good your, uh, your position is, uh, is, is computed and how much noise there is inside. Uh, and you have a speed. And the speed in the, in the GPS case, it's, it's really separate because uh, it's not only using um, a differential of the position before and the, the new position, but it's also using Doppler effects. Uh, so how, how fast the, the you move compared to the, to the signal. So the, the, the new chips really get a, a different computation over there. So, the, so the, there is the speed, which is uh, part, of the, uh, part of the coordinates. Um, and when, what we're missing in order to get into the inside was the floor. So in a sense, it's not that much. But 
we just need to add that specific uh, component, which is which floor you are, you are on. Um, there was a big, big debate, should we use the altitude or the floor to actually uh, use the, use the uh, position yourself inside? Uh, at, at the end of the day, we, for really a lot of simplicity, we, we took the floor uh, because the, our first purpose was not to land the plane uh, on, a, on an airfield, but to actually be able to tell you uh, where, where you are. And the floor is much more uh, understandable than, uh, than an altitude, even if we can have both uh, to, uh, for, for specific, uh, specific use cases. Um, and so when we, um, uh, when, when we do that, so it, it's not that complicated. And, and when, you, when you see how it works with the, uh, with the location on your phone today, when you want to get uh, a position, the position your phone is at, you basically make a request to the operating system, which is iOS, Android, or even your computer, and it's going to give you an object that, that looks like that without the floor. Uh, so we thought we are going to make exactly the same uh, principle and make sure that all the uh, different providers are able to give you a certain object that looks like that and that you can use in any kind of application. In the applications, there are three big families of application that we can, that we can look at. Um, the, the first is wayfinding. How do I get from a point A to point B? That's the most obvious uh, situation. It's what we use uh, more on the, on the daily, uh, daily basis. Um, and, and that, of course, involves for the indoor multiple floors and uh, and, 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 and we can define where, uh, where, what, what would be the destination. So I can say I have a specific auditorium I want to go to, or just give me the closest uh, available meeting room, or get me one of the uh, one of those equipments. So, but at the end of the day, it's still getting to uh, to a specific destination. Um, the other family is linked to asset tracking, where are objects in my building. And objects can be of any type. You can think about medical devices in hospitals. You can think about uh, all kind of uh, uh, specific devices in factories or, uh, or, or linked to, to, to logistics. Uh, we can even consider uh, ourselves as uh, assets if we want to see where your friend is or where, are, uh, where is the uh, surgeon that is uh, uh, on, uh, on, on duty. Uh, in, in, the, in the hospital, or uh, where is uh, an event staff uh, when there are a lot of uh, uh, things going on, or, or where have the uh, security people have been checking the, 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 the building. So, so all of that is more in the family of asset tracking. And the last one is, is building analytics. Uh, how are my square feet used? And that's a very important question for a lot of uh, building owners, because building is still one of the largest costs in every single company. Uh, so knowing how your building is used is, is really important. And here I'm not even thinking about retail, where they would like to see how many people enter a specific store and, and from what store they go to the other stores and, and so on, because that's, that's a whole, whole different world. But in general, knowing how building is used is, is really important. So those are the three really large families of, uh, of usage that, that we see. And so if we, if we go back to indoor location, the idea is to say whatever positioning technology that you are using, you standardize it so that any tool that you will develop in any of those three families, you will be able to feed exactly the same source of indoor location uh, data. Uh, so it doesn't matter, and, and you will be able to also inter interchange them. If you say that part of the building is better for one source and part of the building for another source, you, you can do that. I'll, I'll come back on that in a, in a minute. So the, the framework itself um, not only defines what an indoor location is, but it defines what a, a provider is. And so a provider is simply going to be a class that does everything it needs um, to be able to spit out the indoor location of specific devices. So you can initialize it, start it, stop it. And as soon as it detects a new location, you will get an event, did update location. In that sense, nothing fancy is exactly what's going on with the uh, with the GPS today on, the, on, the, on most of the operating systems. But in that way, we can really standardize it. Um, and so the goal of the framework, which is all open source, is to define those core classes. And then we are working, and we are working with the community to provide as many 
suppliers and, uh, and, and, and providers with uh, those, uh, the, those providers, and also potentially with uh, sample apps. So the, the goal is really to, uh, to, to make those available for, uh, for using in the, uh, in the framework. Uh, we also have basic algorithm to illustrate principles. So if you say I'd like to know how it works to, um, and I'll come back to a few examples afterwards, but uh, put different beacons in, in a room or uh, in, in, in position myself over there, or define that I'm going to make a few steps in the direction, so I'm moving in some directions, we, we can also do that as, uh, as, part, of the, uh, as part of the module. Um, we have modules to combine multiple sources. So you can say when I'm outside the building, I'm going to use the GPS. I'm getting inside. Uh, I'm going to switch to the, to the Wi-Fi. I'm getting in some specific room. I'm going to get to a, to a different technology. Um, and we also have helpers to store, process, visualize data, making heat maps, trying to count how many people have been in certain areas, uh, making big, uh, uh, big data analytics, like how many of us have spent uh, most of our day listening to talk versus going to the uh, exhibition, exhibition floors and, and, and things like that. So the goal is not to replace uh, third party applications. The goal is really to uh, standardize and, and make the development of other applications easier. But I've been speaking about indoor location system. I think I would, I would like to say a few words about what are they? What are the different technologies that we can use today to position you inside of, uh, inside of a building? And we see that there are basically four different principle, basic principles for uh, defining the, um, the, the, the big categories. The first one is proximity. Proximity is when you know you are close to something. And something can be anything that you can sense in your environment. So it could be a QR code that you flash. It could be NFC that you, uh, uh, that you scan as well. Uh, it's the initial use of the, of the iBeacon. So BLE, Bluetooth, Blue Energy, is uh, a standard protocol that uh, is used to, to communicate between any uh, mobile device. Um, and at some point, uh, Apple decided to create the iBeacon, which is nothing more than deciding that a specific frame of the Bluetooth low energy signal uh, protocol would be uh, associated with some specific capabilities. And so they said, okay, that specific frame, that will be listened uh, continuously by the phone, and if there is an ID inside of it and the app is being asking for uh, a wake up when that ID was, uh, was triggered, then we'll trigger the app. And so that was, that was uh, a really uh, big, big step forward into the, all those, those, those proximity. Uh, and so iBeacon started as a proximity uh, standard. Uh, of course, proximity can come with uh, a bit of how far you are. So if you scan a QR code, you know exactly how far you are. iBeacon, it can be scanned a few meters away. So am I really close? Am I, am I a bit far? Am I, am I really far? Um, but still, that's the principle of, of uh, proximity. Uh, and Google decided to afterwards launch uh, Edistone, which is a different standard, still based on, uh, on, the, on Bluetooth low energy, where instead of encoding uh, uh, an ID, which is an ugly uh, uh, set of characters, you encode a URL. But at the same time, it's, it's, quite, it's quite the same principle. Uh, it didn't get the same enthusiasm as iBeacon had. Uh, I'm sure a guy would have found reasons for that. But um, it's, uh, it's still. Uh, an option as well in the, uh, in the proximity uh, uh, techniques. Um, another one that is, that is really interesting and that I really like as well is uh, visible light communication. So today, in the LED that is uh, on, uh, on the ceiling to, uh, to provide uh, uh, artificial light, uh, it is possible to add a very fast signal, a very fast oscillation in the lights that the human eye is not capable of seeing, but that other sensors, and in particular the camera of your phone, is able to, uh, to, to detect. So basically today, if you add a little component before, between the alimentation of the light and the light itself uh, on, the, on the ceiling, and if you are underneath with your, with your phone, and if you have it in your hands and the camera pointing up, you know exactly under which lamp you are. So that is giving you an opportunity to uh, position yourself as soon as you know where the different lamps are positioned in the, in the building. 
Um, so today, it's still quite experimental. So the, the modules are there, and they are sold, and they are the first deployments that are, that are being made. Um, but if we look at uh, what the industry is saying, the lightning industry says that probably in five to, to seven, eight years from now, it's going to cost them more to have two different line of products. And so most probably, they will have the VLC module integrated in any light. So if you're going to go to the retail store and buy your LED, it will be able to give you the, uh, the extra ID. And so they're, they're bringing a lot of more stuff into it. For example, the capability of uh, reading light data, like for how long, how much time did the light was on so far? What's the power consumption? When is it time to, to change it? So all our new services around the light. What we care about here is really the fact that light can emit a special signal that can be picked up. Um, so of course, there is also the Wi-Fi, which are the SSID that are visible, which are the APs, uh, ultrasounds. Uh, if you uh, so, you need to keep the, the, the microphone on for the uh, for the for the phone to hear it, but you can hear those things, uh, or even image recognition. You, you there are some tools where you actually see specific objects and you know where um, where they have been placed, so you can use that. The good thing about proximity is that it's really easy to set up. Um, it never gives you a really accurate position. So you, you know you're in a certain area, which sometimes is good enough for, um, uh, for getting a, a starting point for a, for a trip, for example, or, or, or knowing what's around you, uh, how many meeting rooms, uh, or far are the, are, the, are the meeting rooms from where, from where, are, where I am, or uh, what are the interesting uh, uh, assets that are in the, in the neighborhood. Um, but it's never going to give you a really accurate uh, position. The second family of tools that we can use is uh, tree alteration. So that's, much, that's coming much closer to, uh, to the GPS. So there, we get distances between a, a receiver uh, and uh, a set of uh, emitters, or the other way around, between one emitter and a set of receivers. So you get those distances, uh, and from those distances, we'll infer the most probable position of the, of the device. Uh, and there we can, again, use different technologies. So Bluetooth, low energy is an option. Wi-Fi is a different option. Uh, ultrasound and any other ultra-wideband. Um, so ultra-wideband is uh, specific radio communication. It says ultra-wideband because it sends extremely short signals. Basically, it sends pulses. Uh, and those pulses will be, uh, will be heard. And, uh, and, and that will be used for the uh, computation. The GPS would be typically extremely close to the ultra wideband. So very short signal, frame of signals uh, that you can use to, uh, to, to, to synchronize that. Um, of course, you've already probably heard about the, the first three. So BLE, it's in everybody's phone today. Wi-Fi as well. Ultrasound, everybody can use it, but nobody really wants to uh, turn on the microphone all the time. So it's usually kept for very specific applications. Um, and you have the ultra wideband, which is so far only uh, available for um, dedicated hardware. So we use them for uh, logistic uh, scenarios, for drones, and, and things like that. Um, and I said that the goal was to get distances between where I am and where is the uh, and, and where is a specific object or an emitter that that I that I know about. Of course, I will never be able to measure a distance directly. So there are two ways that I can try to measure a distance uh, using uh, those, kind of, uh, those kind of emissions. And they are RSSI and, and TOF. So receiver signal strength and time of flight. Receiver signal strength is quite easy to measure. We basically measure the, how much energy has been lost between the moment the signal was transmitted to the moment the signal was received. So we estimate the distance from the signal attenuation. For that, we need to know how hard this, what was the power at the emission of the, of, the signal, of the signal. We need to measure the, the power when we receive it. And we know that, by default, um, the uh, propagation is linked to the square of the distance. And that's pretty easy to, uh, to understand, because if you have uh, a certain amount of energy and it propagates, it's going to propagate in a sphere. So the more the signal evolve, and the, the more the energy is going to distribute on the, uh, the odd side of, of the sphere. And so you, that, that's how you get the square of the, of the distance. So the principle is, uh, is really, really simple. Uh, the problem is that it's really 
uh, tightly linked to uh, environment and sensitive to environment. And so signals are going to be disturbed by walls, by metal, by water. And you all know that humans are actually mainly water, so we are disturbing signals a lot. So measuring signals uh, attenuation in a room that is empty or in a room that is full is going to be completely different. Um, and so that's the most technology today, the most common technology today for estimating distances is RSSI. Uh, but the problem is that it's quickly not that accurate and it's really difficult to improve accuracy because it would require a modeling of the environment that is extremely complicated to make. So the, the other option uh, is, is time of flight. And so time of flight, we use the time it takes for a signal to propagate uh, in be between the different uh, emitter and receiver, and we divide it by the speed. And the speed is quite well known and, and very constant uh, in the uh, standard environment. And there, it's important as well to see that uh, speed of sound is much, much lower than the speed of light. And the importance there is that if you want to have a precise measurement of the distance, you need a precise measurement of the time. And so if you have a speed of uh, only 300 uh, meters per second, if you have an accuracy of a few milliseconds, you basically get an accuracy of a few meters or, uh, or less than a meter. Uh, if you want to get the same accuracy for uh, propagation of light and propagation of radio, you need measurements on the nanoseconds, uh, which is still today not that obvious. Um, and so it usually requires specific dedicated chips. Uh, we see that uh, arriving more and more into, um, into standard materials. So the GPS is using it for, for, uh, for 20 years. So we know how to make those chips. It's just that they didn't make it into the, um, into the phones yet. There, there is a new protocol uh, brought by IEEE really recently, uh, which actually brings um, nanoseconds uh, time, uh, yeah, time of flight measurement on Wi-Fi signals. So we're re really hoping that that will, uh, that will go through. But the, the distribution of the, uh, of the hardware that support that today is, is really limited. Um, so that's a really great way of moving forward, but it's still quite, uh, quite costly in terms of, um, of deployment. Um, the other one is linked to fingerprinting. And so there, the idea is you measure signals at a lot of different points in your building. So you know what kind of signal there is. And, so, and when you want to position yourself, you look at the map you created and say, seeing those signals, where are the possible points where I could be? Uh, and so if you say, I've, I've heard that's, that signal for some ADB, some ADB over there, then you will try to uh, invert the, uh, the, the, the measurements and say, this is then the, the place where, where I am. And we can use, again, the same principle, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, um, but even the magnetic field, because since magnetic field is disturbed by, um, by metal and by all kind of things in the environment, uh, which you find a lot in buildings, there, there are options to, uh, to do that as well, uh, that have been proven to work with more or less accuracy, but that, that I will uh, uh, also let you get your opinion on that. Um, and, uh, and so also with, with image recognition. The challenge here is always to keep the map up to date. Um, because since we are measuring, uh, we are making a snapshot of signals that we hear in an environment, if there is anything changing in the environment, uh, we can actually completely disturb the, uh, the map of the, uh, of, the, of the signals and therefore not being able to retrieve the correct position. And the last one is linked to, uh, to movements. So that is not directly giving you a, a final position, but more a, a relative movement from a, po a non position to uh, the position you are right now. So that's a bit what, um, uh, what, what you can think of um, in, uh, so we use it in a lot of other uh, industries, like you have it on plane, you have it on, on cars, what, what happens when you get into, uh, into a tunnel. So we basically consider that uh, you, you know a starting position, you know a starting speed, you check how much time uh, passes, and then you can use the accelerometers, the gyroscope, the pedometer uh, of, of your phone, or of your device, to get an idea of where it goes. Um, of course, that's subject to cumulative error, so it means that if at some point you make an error, there is no way that you will ever be able to, uh, to correct that without any external measurements. Um, and there are also physical limitations uh, that the accuracy of all those sensors decreases with size. Um, and so if you look at inertial uh, uh, units that you put, for example, in, in, in rockets, in planes, in cars, they are more about 
this size and on, on cruise ships or on military ships is like 10 times that. So if you miniaturize that in, in your phone, you will inevitably get a lot of um, a decrease in the, uh, in the accuracy. Of course, next option is to fusion all those sensors and make um, uh, SDKs that you, can, that you can use that combine, uh, that combine all of that. Uh, and so that is something that could be done uh, that, that is done by a lot of different providers directly into, into their system. Or well, that's something that could also be done through the open source framework that we are proposing, saying I'm hearing uh, those kind of signals from a specific uh, provider and some other from a different provider. What can I use uh, in between? That's, for example, something we do with uh, like three iteration on the Wi-Fi side and, and movement uh, in between the, uh, uh, in between the, the measurements. Um, and to complete a little bit the, um, the general picture about the positioning, there are still quite uh, two other big families. One is that the position is defined device side and the other one on the infrastructure side. Uh, so device, the idea is that the device is listening to his environment and defining himself its, its position. So that's exactly what you do with GPS. The satellite has no idea that you exist. It just sends signals, and the phone is actually listening for, for the signals and defining its position. Usually, that's better for navigation, for wayfinding, uh, because you have a much better control on when you turn it on. Uh, so you're, since you only turn it on when you need it, you, you can afford to use a bit more battery. Uh, you can use, um, you can much, con much better control the refresh rate. How often do you get, do you get a new position for, from there? So that's, uh, that's one of the family. The other side is more from the infrastructure uh, side. And the infrastructure, we listen to the device and be able to locate all the different devices that are there. And usually it's be it's, it can be better for tracking and for analytics, so for asset tracking and for analytics, because the infrastructure will not be concerned with uh, or we be concerned diff differently with um, uh, energy consumption uh, or with um, uh, potentially as well with, with privacy. So, uh, so that's, that's the, the different families. If we look at um, what, for example, uh, Cisco is doing on, on the Wi-Fi, um, the, 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 the first uh, things that they deployed was Wi-Fi positioning on the infrastructure side. Since the uh, devices communicate with, communicate with Wi-Fi, uh, the different access points will hear the device. Uh, of course, one access point is going to hear the, the device for the normal communication, but the device also emits some uh, probe requests uh, that will scan across the multiple channels to, to see what are the Wi-Fi that are available. And so those probe requests can be picked up by the different access points from the moment that they hear a, a signal coming from the same device with different uh, dissipation uh, or uh, attenuation of a signal, so it's RSSI, uh, and they know where the access points are, they know kind of where the, the device is. So they, they can keep, a, keep track of where the, uh, the devices are. So they have been, uh, that, this has been integrated in CMX, which is more on the, uh, the, the original line of, of Cisco products. Um, there's also some capabilities like that in Meraki. So that's the kind of thing that can be, um, that can be used as well. Um, yeah, so that's, you see quite a large, um, quite a large spectrum of, of opportunities in, uh, in positioning. So to, to come back to the conclusion, uh, clearly the diversity of uh, positioning technologies uh, made us come to the requirement of standardization. Uh, standardizing the way we actually use uh, as developers, we use those different techniques so that it makes it much easier to, uh, to, to work with. And, and clearly, what we felt as a pain from, um, uh, from developers, uh, either from ourselves or from our clients, is to say every time that we want to make a change or want to try a different provider, we need to go through a completely new set of APIs, a completely new set of requirements. Uh, and so that's, that, was really, uh, that was really complicated and painful. So we, we really thought there was a need to um, converge to, uh, to, a, to a standard for, uh, for our developers. Um, and so that's why we decided to, uh, to push uh, that as an open source framework. And so why did we actually get into the, uh, the open source and what do I see as the, as the pros for the, for the open source? The first thing is that it's really easy to, uh, to work 
with, for partners, and for customers. Everybody can see the base of the code. Everybody can uh, contribute to all the different position providers. They, they see how things are, how things are made. Uh, they, they know what to do if they want to implement their own, their own providers. Um, so that's, that's really uh, a good way to work if you have some base of code that you can share with um, other uh, partners and, and, and customers. Uh, and also the, the customers, they, they, they really like to, uh, to have open source code because it helps the developers in understanding uh, how, things, uh, how, how things work. So to, for pushing something, the, that's, that's really good. Also, we can broaden the, de the development thanks to a community. So we can really try to get more uh, people when they are involved with the, the framework in their daily life to actually uh, push some more, um, uh, some more code and, and some projects on, uh, on, on the framework. Uh, it clearly speed up the, uh, the adoption of the software because that's something that uh, clear developers say today. They prefer to go for open source because they know that it's going to be uh, easier to work with. If they have an issue, they can get dig into the code. They can understand why things, uh, how things work. Uh, and, 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 and they usually don't like to be facing a, uh, facing a black box. Um, clearly, also the objective is to evolve, try to evolve toward a standard, something that everybody in the industry could use um, and that we would, um, uh, that would really simplify the, the life of everybody. And that's also why we completely uh, put it on the side compared to, to, to MapWise, so it has nothing to do with MapWise. We are the, m the main contributor to it today, but I really hope that at some point uh, it's, it's going to be really a, a, an industry standard. Um, and the other thing is that it generates a lot of enthusiasm around the, uh, around the project. Um, and it's uh, so, so it's good opportunities to, uh, to present it in an event like this one. Um, and it opens opportunities for open innovation. And for example, for that, that happened with us recently, um, where we, we said, oh, we would like actually to have modules to process in the location and make heat maps out of them. And that's where we, could, uh, we worked with Microsoft. Uh, and we had developers, evangelists from Microsoft spending uh, in total three weeks to build um, the, some of the processors on Azure. So of course, it's a way for them to get, to get uh, exposure. But that ended up as an open source, uh, open source project, which, which would never have happened if all what we had done was, was stayed as a, as a cloud source. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the cons is that it's still quite uh, repelling for uh, non-tech people. So you still need to explain your investors and your other uh, partners how come you're not uh, just giving away free stuff but you're actually trying to generate new, uh, new value. Um, so you really need to get deep into the, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of developer evangelism. Um, it's an extra workload because you really want uh, the code to be as clean, as documented as possible, because you want people to be able to contribute. Uh, and I know that uh, sometimes when it's uh, internal code, we can take some shortcuts. When it's open source, we really try not to do it. Um, and it's still quite a significant effort to get that uh, community. So it's, it's not because you say, I'm going to try something open source. It's actually work uh, extremely well. So, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's the idea. So if you want to, um, to know more, uh, I'm going to have a workshop today. Is it 1 or 1.30? I'm not sure anymore. But um, at, at 1.30, uh, uh, workshop 4, uh, where I'm going to speak much um, uh, in much more in depth about how you can actually use the position provided by Meraki in order to uh, display it on the, on the map. Um, in the location IO, that's the website and, and the GitHub page, uh, you have my email address if you want to, to contact me. And then if you want to try the map, you can actually scan it, and that's the map of the, uh, of the event. So I can quickly show you what it, uh, it looks like uh, for the one minute that I have left. So the idea is to, uh, uh, how come I'm not on the screen anymore? Oh, yeah, very so uh, the, the idea is to say we have, the, uh, uh, we have the outdoor map, and so we can zoom in. That's the map of the, uh, that we created for, uh, for DevNet Create. Um, and so that's the position that is given real time from the uh, Meraki infrastructure that is deployed in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the space. So if you, go to, if you want to go to, uh, for example, the work for shop, uh, work, Workshop 4, uh, where I'm going to give the, um, the workshop this afternoon. So you can see it's right there. And if you want to go there, you can actually get uh, the path from uh, the, 
the current position to your destination. So that's um, what I wanted to, uh, to share with you. Uh, so uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate. I'm going to be available for, uh, for the entire day and going to be at the workshop as well a bit, a bit later. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Matthew. That was great. Um, Ed, just check the schedule. It looks like your workshop's at 1. Yeah, I think so, too. I don't know why it's uh, 1.30 on the presentation. Awesome. All right. Uh, thanks again. And next coming up at 11.15, we're going to have Heidi Waterhouse, who's going to be talking about choosing your own deployment. So uh, stick around, and we'll, we'll get her on stage shortly.